Good morning. Have a beautiful day. I'm glad to be back here. We missed a weekend there, and that was uh, an enjoyable trip for us, but uh, we miss, certainly miss being here, and we're glad uh, to be fully back. We were here Wednesday night, and at least uh, I was, and it was good to, to be with you. You know, one of the most important things that we can stop to consider while we're here in this life, I truly believe, is our homes. And so I want to endeavor to, to talk this morning about the topic of building Christian homes. We sing a number of songs, including one that always comes to my mind when I kind of put these words together, and that's, God give us Christian homes. It's an excellent song that really portrays the sentiments of much of what I'd like for us to consider this morning. But the reality is that building Christian homes requires a great deal of moral courage, first and foremost. And at the same time, it can seem like an overwhelming task because there's a lot of bad things that happen in this world. And there's a lot of wrong choices that, regrettably, we often make. And we see all around us broken homes. We see all around us ungodly homes. And for all of those reasons, this can be a bit of a touchy subject even when we stop to consider it. And yet, it's no doubt a, a worthy subject for us to stop and consider. And so with our title of Building Christian Homes, I, I kind of want to put in parentheses... You know, this, not really a disclaimer, but a warning, if you will, that moral courage is required. We've got to be willing to look at God's Word for what it is, and that is that it is God, the Heavenly Father's Word. Not man's Word, not Lance's Word, not the Word of any church per se, but it is God's Word. And God has designed and given us the, the plans for a home, an earthly home, under His design, His foundation, His groundwork, His morals. And yes, you and I are going to fall woefully short of that many, many times. But it does not change that this is God's standard. And this is what we are to be pursuing and striving to have. And when it comes to our children and our grandchildren, to the children of this congregation and to those of this community, this is what we should be trying to portray and teach and show. Building a Christian home. I want you to stop and to think with me for just a moment about one phrase from the reading this morning in Psalm 127, and that's the first phrase of verse 1 of Psalm 127. And that phrase says, Unless the Lord builds the house, it also says then in the same sentiment in the next set of teachings, Unless the Lord guards the city. I have never undertaken building a house. Many of you have. I know of some folks who have, and I know that there's great joy in that, it seems like, but there's a lot of headaches with that as well. And why is that? When you go to build a house, I mean, Mariah and I have even talked about it some as kind of a dream down the road. But you go to build a house, and, and if you're building that house, and you know, it's not something that was already built and already in place, then you're going to think about every detail, right? Every doorway, every hallway, every window, everything. And there's a lot of choices, you know, the flooring, the furnishings, the light, and the light fixtures, all of those. There's just so many, just endless, right? And I'm just naming a few. So when building a house, there's just a lot of specifics and a lot of details and a lot to think about and examine. And you'd want to have a good builder, wouldn't you? 
Let me read that statement again. Unless the Lord builds the house. Is there anyone greater that we could contract with than the Lord to build the house? And so when we think about building our earthly home, our physical homes, when it comes to our family and the structure that it's going to have and what it's going to look like and what it's going to feel like, what it's going to act like, who do we need to contract with? The Lord. When we think about protecting our physical homes, there's a lot of security systems, camera systems, and various things that are out there. And it's kind of a shame that we live in a world in which we have to worry about those things. When many of you and many of our parents and grandparents especially, maybe they grew up in a time in which the doors were left unlocked and you expected your neighbors to come over and barge in on you and that kind of thing. And now we live in a totally different world it seems. But do you notice that phrase there also in Psalm 127 in verse 1? Unless the Lord guards the city. I don't care what kind of security you've got. If somebody wants to get in bad enough, what are they going to do? They're going to get in. If somebody wants to do damage bad enough, what are they going to do? They're going to do damage. Spiritually, we need the Lord guarding us. Man can only do so much to us. He can't touch our soul. And so let me ask this. What about the souls within your physical home? Is the Lord guarding their souls? Because unless the Lord guards, it says here, they labor and stay awake in vain. So moral courage is required. I'm not saying this is easy. not saying it's easy at all. But it's worth it. We've got to believe that it's worth it. Can we say that building Christian homes begins with a foundation? That's how building a real home begins, isn't it? You've got to have the foundation. As was read to us a moment ago, Psalm 127 and 128 talks about that. As I've mentioned here in verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. If you notice, it's talking about in verse 3 that Children are a heritage from the Lord. They're fruit in the hand and in the womb of those that are given that. It's coming from God. So recognize the foundation. Where does this all begin? It begins with God. In Psalm 128, verse 1 says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord and walks in His ways. That's a foundational statement. That's where you got to begin. He says in verse 2, When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants all around your table. He's laying the groundwork. This is almost like showing you a blueprint, a design, the foundation on which you're going to build everything. This is the drawings. It's a beautiful picture that he's painting here in Psalm 127 and 128. In 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11, the Scripture says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And this is a a spiritual statement in that you know no, no other gospel can be preached. You can't go and preach that salvation is going to be through anyone but who? Jesus Christ. You can't go and teach that the church can be established upon any other name except for what? The name of Jesus Christ. And so... How should you build a home? Isn't there an obvious parallel here? If we can't have salvation under any other name but Jesus, if we can't have a church under any other name but Jesus, then why should I have a home under any other name but Jesus? There is no other foundation. If I try to found my home on my own name, how good is that? I mean, let's just be honest. We may think well of ourselves and we may have great intentions and we may be great people with great talents, but it can only go so far because can you personally guarantee that the members of your home will get into heaven? You can't guarantee that. Who can? Jesus can. If I'm going to get everybody in my home to heaven, how am I going to do it? By the name and the power of Jesus. And so what foundation should my home be laid on? Jesus. Isn't it pretty clear? There's no other foundation. 
In Matthew 7, Jesus teaches about this in regards to His own teachings. As He was teaching the people, He, he told them that you know, there, there's going to be a certain point at which you've got to understand what you're building on. In Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24, Jesus said, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Now here's two different foundations, a rock and sand. And the one that's built on the rock are built on the teachings of Jesus. And the ones that were built on the rock when the storms of life came, what happens? The house stands. When spiritual storms come, what happens? The house stands. When it's a question of heaven and hell, what happens? That house can stand on the rock and make its way to heaven. But what about the other one who doesn't hear the sayings of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus? It's a house built on sand. And when the storms of life come, what happens? It falls. When spiritual storms come, what happens? It falls. When it comes to the, the day of heaven and hell, what happens? We know, don't we? You see, this begins with a foundation. And a foundation is something that, that you build everything else off of. And so we want to build everything off of the teachings of our Lord. Build on the rock. In Matthew, in Mark, excuse me, Mark chapter 10, Jesus in teaching here refers back to the very beginning of things. And it's very interesting in the way that he teaches about this. There's a whole lot that could be said around uh, the entire surrounding context here, but I just want us to notice what he teaches. In, in Mark chapter 10, in verse 6, Jesus says, From the beginning of the creation of God, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So he's going back to Genesis 1, right? In the beginning. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. If you notice in your text, these uh, words are either italicized or they're in quotes because he's quoting from Genesis. He's quoting these verses. In verse 8, And the two shall become one flesh, so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So he's pointing back to Genesis, to the very beginning of things, to way, the way that God established it, to the foundation that God laid. And he says, God made them male and female. Let's just take for a moment the reality. Building Christian homes. In our society, is there a need to emphasize that God made them male and female? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. There's a major movement in our world, and it has been there all along. But it's certainly true now that there's a major movement to just really wash out the meaning of gender completely. And there's a major effect of that on all of our society. There's a major spiritual effect of that because God has said what He has said, and that is ultimately that homosexuality is a sin. Read the First Corinthian letter. Read Romans 1. Read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. God has made it very clear what His standard, what his moral expectation is on us, and it does not include engaging in homosexual activity. There is a need to emphasize male and female. And there are a number of homes that are trying to be made in our day and time under an umbrella of homosexuality. My friends, these things ought not to be. It's not the way God designed it. And that's what Jesus points out. God made them male and female. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Man and wife. And the two shall become one flesh. And in this context, there was the discussion of divorce even. And that Moses had permitted divorce. But Jesus is saying that's not what God had permitted. In verse 11 and 12, he says, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. 
And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. In Matthew's account of this, we see the lone exception that was given by Jesus, and that was for infidelity, sexual immorality. But the reality is God didn't, God didn't design broken homes. <laughs> that was not His intent, was it? And God didn't intend for there to be homosexual homes. That was not God's intent. And it's very clear in the Scripture, and that's why I say moral courage required, because things that I'm saying this morning could be considered by some, unfortunately, as hate speech. I'm not saying this to be hateful. I'm saying this because it's what God has said. Male and female, husband and wife, and there's a sanctity in that marriage that's to be upheld. That's God's plans. We need to pay attention to them. And so it begins with this kind of foundation. Let's consider for a moment the man of the house. That sounds fun, doesn't it? The man of the house. Everybody wants to be the man of the house. Well, what does it mean to be the man of the house? It means, in God's terms, to be the head of the home. In Genesis 1 and verse 27, we're told that man is created in the image of God. That's a high standard in and of itself, that we're made in the image of God. In verse 28, man's created to, full, to fill the earth, multiply, and to have dominion over the earth. And so there's a great and high calling that is right there from the very beginning of the creation of man. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, the scripture says, But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. So now, hold on a minute, men, <laughs> before we feel too high and mighty. We have an authority over us, and that is Christ. Because remember, what's the foundation? The foundation, that there's no other foundation that can be laid than that which is Christ. He is the head over every man. And so before we think we're too big for our britches, before we think we can do whatever we want to in our own home, we need to back up and say, well, I could do what I need to do under the authority of whom? Under the authority of the Lord, under the authority of Christ, because He is the head of all things, including every man. That the head of every, notice that, the head of every man. You can go rogue and go out here and do what you want to do, men, but who will you give an answer to? Christ. So check yourself, as I check myself, and understand that we are ultimately under the authority of Jesus Christ. Every knee will bow. And so we need to give Him that rightful place of authority in our lives now. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. Now, men, yes, you have a responsibility in the home to be the head of that home. Under the ultimate headship of Christ. And the head of Christ is God. There is a spiritual hierarchy here that we are a part of. In Ephesians 5 and verse 25, the Scripture says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for her. So the command is to love your wives. The example of how is how Christ loved the church. And how, well, how did Christ love the church? He gave Himself, literally, right? All the way to the point of death. He gave His life for the church. That's how we're to love. Head of the home will do that kind of thing. In Ephesians 5 and verse 28, the Scripture says, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Men, let's be careful that we don't take care of ourselves and then kind of give the second hand to everybody else in the home. Can't be the case. We're to love as it is our own. We're, we're connected. We're one flesh. That's what God has taught from the beginning. To love their wives as their own bodies. In verse 29, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Nourishment and cherishing should be a part of a Christian home, from a husband to a wife. In Ephesians 6 and verse 4, the fathers are told to bring the children up in the training and admonition of the Lord. That's men taking leadership in the home to teach the teachings of Jesus to the children of the home. 
moral courage required. Sometimes we lean on the ladies way too much to teach in our homes. It needs to be us men as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, there's a warning that is given and teaching that's given. I want to read this quickly and I'll refer to it again in a moment. In 1 Corinthians 7, beginning in verse 1, it says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. And come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment, for I wish that all men were even as myself. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. See the warning in this text first. Is there a reality of where... Satan and his ways of temptation can get in and wreck our lives if we don't adhere to this text. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sinful passions and desires and lusts have wrecked a lot of homes. The improper relationship between a husband and a wife have wrecked a lot of homes. If we want to be building Christian homes, then we need to take what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 7 very seriously. And husbands and wives, you belong to each other. And you owe certain things to each other. And if that relationship is going south, by all means take care of it soon and fast because it could wreck the home. To those who are unmarried, watch yourself. Because the devil will use that and he will tempt you and he will work on you. And he may wreck your life before you ever get started into building a home. Don't let that happen. Understand what Paul's saying here is real. It's real. And if you want the opportunity to build a Christian home, then you need to get these things reined in to the right place before it's too late. Women, you are to be the helpmate of the man. This is said in Genesis 2 and verse 18 where God said, It's not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a a helper comparable to him. A helpmate for the man. And that's... You know, sometimes I think maybe women think about this in a negative way, that they're reduced in some way. No. This is, you're a gift. A gift given and designed by God. And that's an amazing thing. That should not be looked down on in any way. In Proverbs 31, I'll not not read this text, but in verses 10 through 31, there's this great long description of this virtuous woman whose price is far above rubies whose beauty and excellence really can't be contained. It's just on and on and on the gushing in this text of how wonderful this woman is. And she's a godly woman. And her children praise her. It's the kind of women we need in Christian homes. As we read there in Ephesians 5, in in the midst of all those verses talking to the men, you see what is also told to the women. That the women are to be subject to their husbands, to love their husbands, to cherish their husbands, to respect their husbands. And also women, I would say, you need to listen just as attentively to 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 9 as the men do. And you need to understand what you need to do for your man and for your marriage and for your relationship. And if you're not expressing things to your husband that he needs to know, begin expressing them now. Because that needs to be a relationship that has nothing hidden in secret. Remember that that's Satan's temptation. Look with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I will read this text. In 1 Timothy 2, beginning of verse 8, Paul writing to Timothy says, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere. 
lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Beautiful text. Instructing women to live in modesty, godliness, submission. Silence when it comes to authority over a man but being saved by childbearing and putting on faith, love, holiness, and self-control. If you want to build a Christian home, ladies, there's so much more than just these verses, but I think you see here what's being told. It's a high calling. Moral courage will be required, but it'll be worth it. In Titus chapter 2, in verses 3 through 5, Paul says this, The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemy. It's pretty specific instructions, isn't it? On how to make a godly home. Remember Lydia in Acts chapter 16? She's a beautiful example of what a godly woman can be. In Acts 16, beginning of verse 11, it says, Therefore sailing from Troas, we ran in a straight course to Samphathrace, and on the next day we came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is in the foremost city which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in the city for some days, and on the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. I want you to notice something in this text. In this place, prayer was customarily made, and who is it that he finds there? Women. You know, it's kind of a... a, a known thing, if you listen at all, that in many cases women are more faithful than men when it comes to especially worship and religious activity. Well, here we see it right here in Acts 16. And so men, I, I, I want us to take this as kind of a gut punch because what needs to be said is when they go out to the place of worship where prayer is customarily made, there need to be men there. If we want to really have godly homes that we're building, it doesn't need to be just the women there. It needs to be men and women. In verse 14, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. So notice this about Lydia. She was a seller of purple. Was she taking care of her home? You know, this reminds me of the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. She was obviously taking care of her home. Who worshipped God. They didn't know Lydia very long. But what's one of the first things they knew about her? She worshipped God. It needs to be known of all of us. And she listened to Paul. She listened. She didn't think she already had it all figured out. She was willing to listen. Notice verse 15. When she was baptized, she obeyed. But it doesn't just say when she was baptized. It says when she and her household were baptized. You know what that tells me? Her family was brought up in nurture and admonition by the care of Lydia. So when Lydia said, listen to Paul, What did her household and her children do? They listened. Her and her household were baptized. And then, notice the hospitality. She begs them to stay with her in her home. Pretty impressive, isn't it? It's what we should all aspire to, men and women alike. In 2 Timothy 
chapter 1, we, we often talk about Eunice and Lois, the mother and grandmother of Timothy. But I, I want you to notice something just right here in this text. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 5, it says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, talking about Timothy, when he thinks about the genuine faith in Timothy, notice what he thinks about, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Now, who your mother and grandmother are, that's not everything. But when we build Christian homes, it can have a generation to generation impact, can it? Yes, it can. And that was the case here with Timothy. It's what we need to desire. Just quickly, I want to mention the children, and we can talk, Lord willing, more about this even tonight. But if you notice, as we mentioned in Genesis 1, the command to mankind was to be fruitful and multiply. Children should be had. I mean, that's, that's, that's what God wants us to do. But we're not having children just to have children, are we? Remember the, the promise or the statement in Psalm 127, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. It's, it's a gift from God. In Matthew 18, we're reminded there by Jesus that we're responsible it's a responsibility. And in Ephesians 6, it's very clear in the first several verses that children are to obey their parents in the Lord, which means parents need to be teaching and bringing up their children in the Lord, right? To be obedient, respectful, and as we read there in verse 4, brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, so they're trained in the Lord. Those are high callings and responsibilities for us. Talking about Timothy again in 2 Timothy... In chapter 3, in verse 14 and 15, it says, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Well, who had he learned them from? His grandmother and his mother. And that from childhood, talking about that time, from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. We want our children to be wise to salvation because they're growing up in Christian homes. Well, finally, I'll say this, just to summarize it. Christian homes are founded on Christ. It's, it's got to be. Led by a righteous man of God. That's what the Scriptures teach. Cared for and sustained by his righteous as well, and faithful helpmate, his wife, with children that are growing in the nurture an admonition of the Lord. And I'll say this, after saying moral courage required, this is obviously different from many of the average homes built in our world today. Which means that you and I need to do everything we can to, one, make our home a Christian home. But secondly, we need to reach out beyond these walls to every other home around and encourage them to build a Christian home. And it may be that there's some remodeling that will have to be done. They may have to tear down a wall. They may, not have to, they may have to build an addition. There may be some major things. And so that means it's not going to happen at the snap of a finger. But those of us who are blessed enough to be in a Christian home today, we know it didn't happen overnight but there is no other home that's going to stand in the day of judgment. How much love do we have for our neighbor? How much love do we have for our own family members to be sure that we build a Christian home and that we reach out and we encourage everyone else around us to build a Christian home too? It's a high calling, but we need to get after it. This morning, if, if you're not what you ought to be, God calls you to come home. God calls you to come home. Just like the prodigal son that was welcomed back into the father's home, God will welcome you back into his home today. And we'll pray with you, we'll pray for you, we'll cry with you, and we'll laugh with you and rejoice with you. Whatever it is that you need, we want you to feel like you can come home to God's home right here today. God's with us. Or two or three are gathered in His name. He is with us, and He'll welcome you home.
today. If you need to be baptized into Christ, if you need to lay that first foundational block, do it today. Give your life to Him. Put to death the old man of sin and the watery grave of baptism. We'll baptize you and we'll rejoice with you and heaven will rejoice if you'll just have the courage to come and have that response today while we stand and sing.